In the name of God, most gracious, most merciful. Thank you again. Let me tell you a little bit about myself. I am, my name is Sina Baha. I just, as I mentioned earlier, I'm an immigrant. I'm an Afghan American. I was born in Kabul, Afghanistan. But I say I'm from Wardag because that's where my ancestors were born. We belong to our ancestral regions. I am from the Pashtun tribe, so I am a Pashtun. I was born during the war and left Afghanistan when I was 18, migrated to Australia in 1993, then to US in 1995. My father was an officer in the army during the communist regime, and he wasn't pleased the way the government was ruling. So he, him, along with many other Afghans, uh, they, they, they just made this group and he was leading a group of officers to um, organize a coup d'etat against the communist regime. Unfortunately, they had an informant in their group. He was captured and sent to prison along with other officers and we never saw him again. So he was most likely executed. We never knew what happened to him up until now, but in 2013, a document was released to public by the Afghan government that it consisted of the list of 5,000 martyrs where my father's name was included. Let me tell you a little bit about the geography of Afghanistan. Afghanistan is located in the heart of Asia. Capital of, is the size of Texas, roughly. Capital of Afghanistan is Kabul. The history of Afghanistan is very long and very, very heart aching, but I'll just share, I'll try to make it as brief as I can. July of 1973, Daoud Khan declares himself as a president in a coup against his cousin Zahir Shah. April of 1978, the communists within the military assaulted the president, killed Daoud Khan and all his family members. Uh, July of 1978, a rebellion against the communist government started. In December of 79, the Soviet Russian army invaded Afghanistan to save the communist government from collapsing. So that was the invasion of the Soviet Union from 1979 up, to, up until 1989, they stayed in Afghanistan and they tried to um, capture and uh, invade it. February of 1989, after 10 years of war, war again, you know, the Mujahideen, the freedom fighters, like, of course, uh, didn't want the Russian or any foreign invasion. After 10 years of war and misery of the Afghan people, the last Soviet troop left Afghanistan. April of 1992, Mujahideen overthrew the communist government in Kabul. From 1992 to 1996, the civil war continued. This was a war between different factions of Mujahideen fighting with each other for power and prestige. This is the time when the first Taliban started a small group and slowly removing the local commanders in Afghanistan, warlords, and they initially, Talibans were initially welcomed in Afghanistan because of a lot of instability and killing of innocent people. September of 1996, the Taliban removed the Mujahideen government from Kabul. And uh, September 11 of 2001 is when the tragic attack on US uh, Trade Center and Osama bin Laden, he was operating in Afghanistan with his group, the unfortunate event. October of 2001, the US and coalition of NATO countries attacked Afghanistan to remove the Taliban from the government and warlords. The Taliban forces left Kabul and made way to the new government in 2000, December of 2001. A couple of years later, Taliban regrouped from their bases in Pakistan and started fighting the Afghan government and the coalition forces. They slowly gained more ground from 2003 up until 2001. They, they were gaining more ground and trying to get, come back to and control and, and take over the whole Afghanistan. And eventually, August of last year, Taliban, Taliban entered Kabul without any resistance and took control of the whole Afghanistan. And that has been the reason for many of these refugees to arrive to US and other countries. So throughout this 40 years of war, around 5 million Afghans have fled the country and settled in different parts of the world. What are the neighboring countries of Afghanistan geography? Afghanistan is a mountainous country. To the south is Pakistan, India, China, Northeast. Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, and Tajikistan, Iran is to our west.
There are several ethnic groups such as Pashtun, Tajik, Uzbek, Hazara, Baluch, and so forth reside in Afghanistan, but they all consider themselves Afghan. Pashtun is a dominating ethnic group and it makes 60% of the population. The second largest ethnic group is Tajik and so forth. There are 30 different dialects spoken in Afghanistan, but Pashto and Dari are the most common languages. Population in Afghanistan is about 30 to 35 million. However, due to the war, the census has not been performed in a really long time. So there is uh, expected of there are a lot more than 30 million in the Afghanistan population. Culture, the Afghan people are devoted into their faith, very strong followers of their Muslim faith and strong followers of their custom and cultures, which is passed on from generation to generation. These ca customs are part of everyday life and functioning of the society. First of all, hospitality of their guests is a big part of the Afghan culture. When you're a guest in an Afghan house, you're considered as a family. So um, yeah, it's a big deal for Afghans when they have guests, they're considered more than a family. And sense of community, Afghans, have always lived in a communal houses and a sense of community is a big deal for Afghan cultures. They try to help out with whoever they can. Afghans value their freedom and the freedom of their country. Afghanistan has never been occupied by any foreign forces because of free, their freedom of choice and freedom of the country is a big deal. Respect for women, although the media does not show it this way, but women have a lot of value in, in the religion and the cult, Afghan cultures. Refuge, um, if you take refuge in an Afghan house, no one can touch you, you're under the protection of that household. It's a very big deal. Council, Jirga, all those uh, issues in a village or in a city or in a town are resolved by uh, gathering of elders and they try to resolve the issues or whatever problem that town or family has. Respect for elders and kindness to children. Elders are not being called by their first names. They're usually associated with uncle or aunt and children are usually referred to with kindness and love. What has been the war outcome in the past 40 years? Hundreds of thousands fled the country and migrated to different parts of the world, not to mention millions have lost their lives. Economy has been shattered, no advancement in education. There has been agricultural catastrophe. Industrialization has not advanced in the past 40 years. And I guess tonight we are here to see how each and every one of you can help the Afghan resettling in the US, no matter where you are, what city, if you feel like helping the Afghan families, there are many different ways to help the families. Uh, the first thing you gotta do is to reach out to a resettlement agency, in this case, the Reher Center, and uh, reach out to them and see if there's a family you can help, but most Afghans don't speak English. So you would need a translator. Sometimes Google Translate works the best. I have tried it myself and I have shown folks here in Kansas. Some specific ways you can help is teach them English. It can be an English teacher to children or adults. Teach adults how to drive. Most of these people probably have license or they have driven in their country, but in Afghanistan, no one follows a traffic law. Everyone just drives at their own speed and their own way. So try to teach them that how to drive on the streets in the US. Help with kids, enroll them in schools, talk to a school counselor and tell them about the children's situations. They probably need extra help with tutoring or request for, for free lunches. These are just some basic stuff. Most of all, connect the families to an Islamic center. They really appreciate that. I have seen it with my own eyes. When you do that, they're so grateful to you. That's all I have for tonight. If you have any questions, so go ahead and thank you. Thank you so much, Sina. So yes, feel free to put your questions in the chat, but we'll hear from Khadija next, um, and then we'll turn it over. And just, Sina, one of the things that you shared with me in our conversation before is just how wide ranging the questions that you, you know, have, have been brought have been. And so I wanna just encourage everyone, you know, although we ask you not to ask about politics, anything you can think of about culture, about how to be welcoming, all of these kinds of things that you may wonder. I think I'm right in saying, Sina, what you had said is that it's, <laughs> It's open. They they want to help, right? Yes, they want. If anyone wants to help, any question is no small. Just, just don't be shy. Just go ahead and ask, and I'll do my best to answer this question. Me and Khadija. 
So keep, keep thinking and generating and let's hear from Khadija. Thank you, Sina. I think that was, uh, she summed up everything for me, but um, just a few things that um, I think is very important um, for Afghan refugees coming here. I know at BART, we got a lot of uh, students. Um, we got more than um, 37 students uh, coming this term and then 60 other are coming next uh, semester. So we, we dealt with that um, in our own ways. Um, and I think a big part of it uh, with Afghan refugees not coming to school, but coming to communities is um, having a shelter is the, like the most important thing, having a space to um, be and call home, um, especially given that they're, they're coming from their own homes, leaving their own homes. So I think just having a shelter um, and as Sina was mentioning before, we are very used to um, being in a communal space. So I, I don't remember ever sleeping alone uh, when I was at home. I was always sleeping next to my sister and my siblings. Um, we just, uh, we, we just like to do that. Um, that's like a big part of our culture. Um, and then, so even if it's a smaller space, I think having a place to call home is a big, uh, part of how we can help them. Um, and the other thing is food. I think food is a big part and sometimes we forget about that. But I know that with the students coming here, we have experienced that that they, they miss food from home a lot. I mean, when I came here first in 2017, I, it took me a long time to get accustomed to the food here. So just connecting to local groceries. I know that in Hudson, there are some groceries that are uh, that might not be um, directly from like owned by Afghan people, but they are probably owned by like folks from India or Bangladesh, which are very similar culture, similar food options. Um, so like providing them with halal meat, which is like a certain way of butchering the animal. Um, which is like another important part of um, what, you know, these people might um, need. Um, and then the other one, as um, Sina mentioned, is religion. I think that's a big part of it, connecting them to like a mosque, a local mosque, um, or just like an Islamic center. Um, there's a mosque in Kingston, I know. I'm not sure if there is one in Hudson, but that's a big part. I know um, back home, you know, there are mosques everywhere and you hear, um, the Azan, which is like the, the, the call for prayer. And I think um, that's missing from here. When you come here, you miss that. Um, so I think doing that, I know there are apps that tells you like the times for prayers too. So maybe showing them that, um, I'm sure most of them would know that, but just the location when it changes, some of the apps gets unavailable. So maybe helping them with that is a big one. And then language, I know that uh, Sina mentioned this also, um, not all of them coming here might know English. Um, maybe maybe the kids, um, just because over the, you know, the past 10, 20 years, the kids have gone to institutions to learn English. So maybe the kids might know, but parents uh, might struggle a bit. So getting them tutors, I know that, um, you know, connecting them with schools and colleges are the best way. Uh, we can start a tutoring program for them um, once a week. You know, you can just talk to them, have a conversation, and then that's how they can learn English. That's how I learned English. I, I had a tutor who was in the U.S. and I would just Skype with them. So it's, you know, and especially now that they need it, I think it will be much faster um, to learn English, but also just like a few like things to know, like how to ask for food when they go to the groceries, um, basic things in English. And then also um, in terms of work, I know that a lot of them might um, need help with work, finding jobs. Um, like a lot of them might struggle like with like getting their social security number, opening a bank account. That's something that we are dealing with right now at BARD. A lot of our students um, didn't have their social security number or couldn't find jobs. That's something that um, is a big part of uh, that transition. Um, I know that you know they would wanna work. Um, something about Afghan people, they wouldn't just accept like food or charity. They just wanna work for that. So I think 
that would be um, like really helpful helping them through that process. And then the last one for me is education. I know that um, a lot, I mean, a lot of uh, the kids back home um, have been deprived of that, but I know that a lot of families have tried their best to send their kids to school, even though it has been such a struggle, even right now, people are sending their kids to school, trying different ways, um, providing education to their daughter. So I know like coming here, they might need that. So like as Sina mentioned, enrolling them to school, um, even like working with different communities, I know that um, BARD would be one that um, would be very helpful. Uh, we have, I mean, our Center for Civic Engagement have been very helpful in terms of getting students evacuated. So education would be a big part of that transition, getting their kids to school, which I think most of the parents would worry about that. But that's all I have. Um, and if you have any questions, um, I might have forgotten something. So you can feel free to ask me in the chat or you can email me later. But yeah, thank you so much for giving me this time to share this with you, my perspective and just having a lot of students back here at BARD. Um, it has helped me a lot to gain that perspective. Thank you. Thank you so much, Khadija. Um... Wow, so much, and there are a lot, I know you guys can't see them, Khadija and Sina, but there are a lot of questions that have been coming in, and I'm going to try to, to share some of them, and, and folks, feel free to keep asking, but um, there were a couple around, around this question of food, um, so let me just tell you two on that. One question is, what, what dish do you miss the most? And the second is more specific, which is, is halal meat killed in the same way as kosher meat, if you, if you know? Can we get meat in a kosher supermarket? Does that include chicken? So. Eat. I'm on a Zoom, hon. So do either of you wanna take, take uh, the question about a dish first? Well, I'll let Khadija explain what, the, what dish she missed the most, but I can go ahead with the meat part. <laughs> um, most of the Afghans, you know, I have came across a lot of Afghan families here in Kansas City. I, I told you earlier, like around 1,000 people, so around 300 or 400 individual families. And the Biha meat is a big deal for them. So it has to, they have to be able, one thing is that they are in a foreign country, so they really like to trust the system, the people, and even us. So they would like to see if the meat is Zabiha or it says Zabiha halal. So I'm not sure if kosher will cover that part of it, but there are, I mean, Kansas City is not a very big city, but there are tons of Zabiha uh, butcher shops. So I'm sure Hudson Valley has a Zabiha shop. So it's preferred for them to get their meat from a Zabiha store, halal slash Zabiha, whatever you want to call it. The groceries, like Khadija mentioned earlier, like Afghans, they love to have bread. And most of the families here, they bake their own bread. So just provide them, don't get them a, a dough machine. They would like to do knit dough with their hand, just give them a big bowl, mixing bowl, and they will make it their own, get them yeast and stuff. They can bake their own bread in the stove and rice, mm -hmm. vegetables and rice. So these are the big uh, food items that we provide with our families. Mm -hmm. But Khadija can go ahead and tell us if, but her, what was the dish she missed the most when she moved here. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I miss all the food, um, but I think the, the ones with me, just because it was, it's much harder to find the like halal meat, especially in a college campus. So there's uh, this dish called mantu. It's kind of like dumplings and it's filled with, um, um, with just beef uh grounded beef and it's really delicious you put you have like chickpeas on top with um cilantro and yogurt it's really good um but in terms of halal also there's um there's a store in kingston that has halal meat um i know about that um but if you i know that our dining hall on campus um have a contract with um like this company that provides them halal chicken so if, if that's something that you're interested, I can connect you with our dining hall and maybe they can give you the name of the vendor. Um, so maybe, probably that's also local or somewhere close by. Just a follow-up question to that. Do you know what the name of the store in Kingston is that has halal meat? I don't, but I can get that to you. Okay, 
that sounds good. Um, another kind of line of questioning uh, that's come through in the chat is, is ways of being respectful. Um, so here's a question. Is it perceived as rude or intrusive to enter the living space of an Afghan family during prayer time? Um, this person says, we sometimes come to the house and they're in the middle of praying. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would say when you enter an Afghan house, first of all, take off your shoes, please. Enter their house with, you know, no shoes because we pray on the carpet sometimes or a prayer rack, we, we just lay it anywhere in the house. The house is considered to be a clean space. And try not to disturb them. Try to call them ahead if you're gonna go visit. Try not to go there during the prayer time because during the prayer time, we cannot answer anyone. We cannot talk. We cannot, we cannot end the prayer just because the door is knocking. So make sure that you don't go to their house during the prayer if you can. Just have, you know, like, five daily prayers, just kind of know the roughly the times or just text them ahead of time. Like, hey, I'm gonna show up at this time. Is that okay? So I think they'll appreciate that. Also, if you kind of end up in a situation where they're praying and you're just standing there, you can, I think you can be in the same space. Um, I mean, we pray like we, you know, we live in the same house and we pray like in front of each other, but it's just staying quiet in that time, no TV, no phone, no videos, just so they can concentrate. And then, you know, after they're done, you can, you know, talk to them. Another question on this, on this line of sort of respect has to do with the gender. And it, it was, I think, from a man, um, what is the best way for Americans to show respect to Afghan women and girls, but with the understanding that we have wide cultural differences? It could have been from a woman too, I suppose. What I have experienced from the refugees who are arriving, this group of refugees from the most diverse groups of Afghanistan, by the mean most diverse from different parts of Afghanistan. So there are people who come directly from Kabul, they have exposed to you know how to deal with American or with foreigners and then there are some people who have never seen Americans in their lives. So this is the most diverse group of people who are arriving here. Respect is yeah when your women do not like to shake hands with an opposite gender. So don't try to approach women and shake hands with them and don't get offended when they don't want to do that. So that's one way and when you talk to them a lot of times not just sometimes women especially women they don't want to make eye contact with you. That doesn't mean that they are shy or they are scared. It's just that it's part of our culture that when we speak to someone, we don't like to make eye contacts, especially with the opposite gender. So don't be offended by that. Just respect that. And take off your shoes when you go to their house, especially call or text them if you're visiting. Um, that's all I can think of, Khadija. Do you have anything to add to this? Yeah, I, I was just uh, thinking it's really different when you're coming from the city, um, from like the big cities, just because you have been exposed to different work environment, you know, women work and they uh, work with uh, the opposite gender. They are very comfortable in terms of like um, just living in the same space, working together. Um, you know, they go to coffee. They, I mean, I, I was in Kabul in 2019. Um, I was you know, going to the coffee shops, working with my friends on different projects. So I think those women might have a different um, com level of comfortability with like uh, working with men or just interacting with them than versus women who might have come from villages who might have not had that working experience or that exposure. Um, so I think they're different levels and I think you will get a sense of that you know some women if they want to shake hand they will just come up to you or shake hand and you know some might not so um they're they're different so I guess like knowing the different regions regions they're coming from is um important so that's a line of questioning that you started uh, um answering already so I'll go there um one, it's about furnishing houses. Um, and so one question was about if in furnishing the house, they should provide a special shelf for shoes. And another is, um, are the needs for a house different if the family is coming from a rural area versus coming from a city? And, and how would you recommend they think about uh, how to furnish the house differently based on where the family is coming from? Most of the families I have seen here in Kansas, they like to sit on the floor so they hate it when the houses are not carpeted, when it's hardwood floor or tiles, and they constantly ask me for area rags and carpets. And I delivered two area rags last week, and I'm expecting four more today donations, and I'll deliver those as well. So if a place is carpeted, 
they really like that because they don't like walking. You know, we don't walk with our shoes on inside the houses. We take off our shoes so it's barefoot. So it's more comfortable to walk on carpet. And uh, yes, yeah, so this they mainly like to sit on the floor or some comfortable sofas and couches. But nothing, I mean, I don't think, you know, if people are coming from the city or the country, so yeah, they're used to sitting on the floor on the mattresses, but we cannot provide them with those here in the US. So eventually they will get used to sitting on sofas, but they really like to have carpets on the floor, not just uh, hardwood flooring and tile. Yeah, and I think as time goes on, hopefully they will figure out how to make those mattresses themselves. Yes. <laughs> So another line of questioning, and, and thank you, you're doing, this is, I'm learning so much as, as are we all. And, and there's another line of questioning here that's a lot about religion. Another follow-up question about prayer time. Is it important to schedule appointments like doctor's appointments or social security at times so as not to interfere with prayer? Another question is, is there a Sabbath day for the Muslims when they preserve that family time only? Um, how much experience might Afghans have with people of other faiths like Judaism, Christianity, et cetera? And um, there was one more here. Ah, are there any important holidays or cultural events coming up this spring and summer that may be observed by our Afghan neighbors? So lots of questions there. Um, I'll let Sina, if you wanna share, and then I, I have a lot to say also. Okay, me too. <laughs> Okay, let's get to your the special holidays. Yes, Ramadan is coming around. It's on April 2nd. It's a month of fasting. So Muslims, we fast from dawn to dusk every day for 30 days. And at the end of this month is, is Eid, which is a big celebration for us. Eid is, I would say, compared to Christmas or um, in a big Jewish holiday. So it's day of celebration, day of eating and just partying and dressing up and exchanging gifts. But Ramadan is a very special time. Me, even my family, we didn't do a lot of activities during Ramadan. Like I don't try to schedule too many doctor's appointments. So I try to focus on my prayer and my, uh, you know, my relationship with God in that time. That's a whole month. It is a long time. We don't stop not going to school or to work. We continue our life as much as we can. But if there are extracurricular activities, for instance, my kids being in soccer and different um, sports we try not to go to this game so for a whole month the coaches are really mad at us yeah like you guys are not showing up to the games i'm like if it's early in the morning sorry <laughs> you're gonna miss those games so stuff like that we try to uh, accommodate during ramadan it's good to remember and then every night it's a feast in every muslim household around uh, the time when we break our fast which is these days it's around seven o'clock seven well here in kansas it's six o'clock it just varies in every state depending on the timing of the sunset. So that was one. The second question, I don't remember the other questions now. <laughs> oh, let me see if I can find them. <laughs> Hadiza, you want to jump in? Do you remember? Yeah. I, I, I know that they were talking about like um, appointments, like having appointments during different times, uh, different prayer times. I think if you can avoid it, it's helpful just um but also the windows of uh, like prayer time is uh, like long so like morning it's like until the sun rises you have time to pray so it's not like a specific um hour it's just like a window of time that you can pray um so that's i mean if you want i can send you the app that i'm like uh monitoring the prayer times because it changes based on like Every day, um, the prayer times changes, um, just like the way that they light and that they, um, like as the um, sun comes out earlier or later, the time changes for prayer as well. So um, that would be, I would say maybe ask them. I feel like everyone have like their own preferences, but if it's a, um, and a time that can be avoided, I think it would be helpful, but overall i think it should be fine just because the windows of like prayer time are longer i would just want to add one thing to you khadija is that um during friday men are supposed to go to friday prayer to the mosque so that's the time that appointment should be avoided completely which mm -hmm. is usually from 12 to 1 30 just depending on 
your state and what time the Friday prayer is being performed in your local mosque. That's the time that men cannot skip. Mm -hmm. So, but the rest of the prayers, they're flex, I mean, not flexible, but there's a time window, just like Khadija said. So it doesn't expire until that time is passed. So those could be a little bit flexible, except for Friday noon prayer is for men. I mean, mainly when I go to Friday prayer whenever I can, if I don't have anything to do. So that's the time which I don't schedule any appointments or any activities also. So that could be something to keep in mind. And uh, yeah, Jummahs, um, Fridays, or we call it Jummahs, they are like um, the holy days. Um, back in Afghanistan, we have those days off, but I know that here we still have to do work uh, on Fridays, but that's usually a holiday for us back home. So I guess that's another transition they have to figure out because they have Saturdays and Sundays off. But for us, Saturday is the day that we start work or school, and then we go until Thursday. That's, That's one of the questions here, actually, was about how how do men or how might folks talk to, to future employers or potential employers about the work on Friday and, and what might supporters do to help um, with that. And then the other questions that I had said before and kind of helped me find again were about um, how much experience might Afghans have with people of other faiths like Judaism, Christianity, etc. And are there other religions other than Islam practiced by Afghans? I would say, um, I mean, most of Afghans um, are Muslims. Uh, but we do have um, sick people, Sikh people um, in Afghanistan, but I think their population, it's not a lot. Um, and I think their exposure to different faiths is not a lot, um, unless they, you know, have lived in the city uh, mostly and have interacted with different people from different faiths. But um, I would say that that would be another part of um, the tr their transition to get um, accustomed to people from different faiths and different cultures. Um, I mean, different prayer uh, days for them, because I know like Sundays are like very um, sacred for um, some people. So th that would be a transition too as well. So maybe, maybe like a flyer that talks about them would be helpful, um, but I don't know whatever you seem fitting. And when you said prayer time during work, Sarah, is that what you know kids can do who are at school, they take five minutes of their lunchtime and they can perform their you know, noon prayers. And Friday, some of the folks, they just take half an hour off. They just drive to their local or the mosque that's closest to them. They perform the prayer and then go back to work. That's mm -hmm. what, I mean, it just depends on the flexibility of their work. It is mandatory for men, especially, but then job comes, you know, you have to gain a living too. You cannot just leave your work just because you have to pray Friday. There are flexibilities. God does not hold you accountable for these stuff. So it just depending on individuals. And when you said about, you know, the experiences with different faiths, I agree with Khadija. No, they do not have much exposure with different faiths. And one of the things that I have seen with refugees here in Kansas City is that they do not like to be engaged in uh, religious discussion with other faiths because they feel like they're being uh, attacked and they, they absolutely hate it and they, they just don't want to get engaged in those uh, discussions. So if we can please avoid that until they get used to this environment, the people, and then later on, maybe you can have a discussion. But right away, when you have a discussion, they get offended and they completely block you from their life. They're like, you know, why? What, what do you want from me? So try your best to help them to trust you. If you're, you know, if anyone in this group or listening today want to help them out, and I'm sure there are a lot of folks, trust you and by trusting you, don't get engaged into um, religious discussions, please. Well, maybe in part because they're hearing you, they have a lot more questions for you about religion. <laughs> so here's, here are a couple. Um, uh, one is about, uh, Nauruz, which is a, a holiday, I guess, coming up in April. They want to know how that's celebrated. Another one is is wondering at what age children are engaged in, in daily prayers. Another is um, about uh, female uh, 
visitors coming into Afghan homes and if they should cover their head to be respectful. Okay. And these are for me, Sarah, you said? For, for both of you. Okay, now Ruz is not a religious holiday. Now Ruz is actually the first day of the New Year's. In Afghanistan, we follow a completely different uh, calendar. It is the calendar of the Hijri, which is the Islamic calendar, but the Hijri of the, I mean, the migration of uh, following the solar calendar, not migration of the lunar calendar, which is the original Islamic calendar. So it is an Islamic calendar, but it's followed by the solar. So Nowruz is the first day of spring, which is March 21st, but it's not a religious holiday. Eid is a religious holiday and it's being celebrated by, you know, when we, it's the last, you know, it's the end of Ramadan and it's a huge celebration. We feast and we eat until we get into a food coma on that day. <laughs> we dress up and we celebrate, that's Eid. And then, you know, the differences between male and female uh, when do they start praying is at the age of puberty is when they start when the prayer is mandatory on them you know kids start praying my children started going to a mosque when they were at age four and that's when they learn how to pray and I also what I have done with my children is that if they want to fast they see me and their dad fasted so they try to fast just they call it uh, ha, you know I'm just going to do half a day fast so they'll fast from 7 a.m. to 12 when they were like five six year old so at a young age, we let them do that when they're adults and they got used to it. And it's not because fasting during summer is not easy. Let me tell you that you get thirsty, you get tired and it's exhausting, especially if you're at school or at work. But, but it becomes mandatory on them at the puberty and prayer also becomes mandatory on, on children. So we've had um, several requests, Khadija, uh, for you to share more about the work that you're doing and, and the work that you're doing for your family specifically. So if you're comfortable doing that, that would be wonderful. Um, the work I'm doing in terms of what I'm doing at Bard. Um, I think the work in Afghanistan. Okay, yeah. Um, so I have been, just to answer your question, I think a, a part of it, you mentioned if a female visitor is coming to um, someone's home. Um, I would say no. Um, I think everyone should be comfortable dressing up the way they want to. Um, maybe not like too much, uh, just like showing off <laughs> your skin, but I think you're as long as you're just your normal clothes, I don't think you need to wear a scarf. Um, um, I think you'll be fine. Um, but um, in terms of um, just because we want them to also get accustomed to the culture here and learn more about it. Um, but in terms of the work I have been doing, I we started um, Sunita Lizara, who's my um, my best friend here at Bard. Um, she's a she's a rapper, and she you know she, I'm sure you guys know about her. She's an activist against child marriage and women's rights. Um, she, uh, we started a project um, like two years ago um, about helping uh, children back in Afghanistan. So we would um, fundraise here and help two kids per month, um, bring one of their wishes come true. Um, so we would do like video diaries, take their videos and ask them, um, what do you want? Like, what's your biggest dream? What's your smallest dream? And for example, one of the kids, a dream was to buy a bike for his brother, for his older brother. So what we did was, you know, we fundraised and we bought him the bike and he gifted it to his brother. So those are the, um, that was the intention. And this was happening in Herat, which is a, another province in Afghanistan. And that we expanded it in Kabul as well. Um, and we were working with different groups of, of volunteers um, in those locations. But then when, when Afghanistan in August 15 um, was uh, taken over by the Taliban, it was hard because we couldn't send money anymore uh, through Western Union. Um, we couldn't even fundraise. Uh, most of our GoFundMe's were flagged. So um, a lot of money that we have fundraised, uh, around 5,000 was uh, blocked in GoFundMe. So we couldn't even take that out. So we had to come out with a different way of helping uh, these uh, people. And also we had to expand our project because now there were a lot of women at risk 
who couldn't escape the country and were hiding um, and couldn't, didn't have a job. So they were, and they had a family to feed. So we had to think um, about how we could help them. So we came up with this, um, we, we fundraised for a month or two and we raised around $6,000. And then we were able to actually um, get that from GoFundMe with the right information through our institution and the different organizations we are working with um, to say that this money is not going to the Taliban and it's actually going to the people who need it. And then we were able to purchase uh, food packages through an app. It's called Asil and they, they, we purchased around 500 um, food packages um, and for the families. So each in the 500 individuals, but then their families, so it could be more. Um, so that's our plan to keep doing that. Um, and right now, I mean, we just wanna help families um, in general, um, but hopefully we can, you know, shift our focus back to kids again. Um, so now we are, we are gonna start our fundraising again. Um, to be able to help those families right now. I mean, right now it's not a very sustainable project just because we are trying to help those um, who are, you know, simply trying to survive. But we are hoping of different ways to kind of maybe provide students with scholarship to continue their education. Um, even if we can help one kid, um, that would be like a lot. So that's something that um, I've been doing with my friend and also, um, you know, the whole BARD community has been really helpful. Um, our project is uh, supported by the Civ Center for Civic Engagement and the TLS project, which is um, the Trustee Leader Scholar pro uh, Program at BARD. So if you're interested, they work a lot with the community. I'm sure some of you might have heard about that. But um, in terms of what I'm doing with my family, I'm still uh, figuring it out. It's hard just because a lot of um, a lot of uh, people don't have um, passports, so that's a big one. And you know they're waiting in lines to get their passports, or and if they have passports, they're waiting in lines to get visas uh, for like different countries, um, and that has been just really tough. Um, and in terms of you know, like international community, they have blocked Afghanistan just because of the Taliban, but it's really hurting the Afghan people who are there um, because they don't know what, you know, the economy is shattering and have collapsed completely because the international community have blocked all the aid. So um, that's something I know that's very, um, not, not getting into politics of it, but and that's uh, like a reality that has ha been happening. And we are trying to figure out other ways to, you know, still help them, but not um, cross the line and, you know, do something that might be um, helpful to like the Taliban. Uh, so, um, yeah, I don't know if that answered their question, but that's something we have been doing. Thank you for sharing all of that. Is there um, a website or a place where we could, um, you know, share if, if folks want to learn more about that effort? Yes, yes. We actually have, um, I can share that with you. We have a TLS project uh, page, so I'm going to get that for you. There are a couple of more very specific um, questions here, and we do have about another 10, 15 minutes of time, you know, reserved for, for questions. So if folks have things that they have been wondering if they should put in the chat, don't be shy, <laughs> go ahead. Um, here are some of the very specific ones. Um, a, one is about a special kind of baking pan um, to supply for bread. And if there's a special tray for shoes or if they're just left by the door um, and how that, you know, how to go about being most helpful in setting up these homes. I can answer that. Yes, a, a small shelf by the door so they can place their shoes will be great. Because as I mentioned earlier, they, in Afghans, they don't walk around in, inside their homes with shoes on. 
and a baking tray, yes, I have had that request from almost every family that I have visited. So just those flat baking trays that we usually bake cookies, it could be round or uh, rectangular. That's how they bake their bread and a large metal um, mixing bowl, if you can, so they can knit their uh, doughs in it. So they would appreciate that. Also, if anyone else is interested, pressure cookers are in high demand. <laughs> but not the electric ones, please. Just get the, the, and I can send you a link of the ones that I think they really like, Sarah, if you like. Um, the electric ones, some of the families receive the electric pressure cookers and they're like, what are we gonna do with this? We don't like these electric ones. We want the ones that we used to, we are used to using it at home. So those will be um, greatly appreciated. What I have done, one of the places that I gave my talk and I suggested making like a welcome basket and that's totally up to you guys if you wanna do it. So in the welcome basket, just put a pressure cooker, if you guys can, some scarves, because a lot of these ladies who come, at least they first, if, if they wore scarf forever, so they will use it. Some green tea, um, some sugar, and just a little bit of stuff, and then mainly the pressure cooker. They really, really like that, and they appreciate that. So some stuff to keep in mind. A prayer rag and a copy of a Quran, if you guys can get hold of one. You can reach out to your local mosque. Sometimes they have extra ones for donations. That's what I have done here in Kansas City. This is a good segue to one of the questions we have here, um, which is for, for both of you, for Sina and Khadija, what were some of the things that made you feel welcome and supported when you first came to the United States? Are there specific moments or efforts you remember being most helpful and meaningful to you? I, I'll let Khadija answer this because when I came to US, I got married with my husband and I moved here from Australia, which was sort of similar culture. So I'll let Khadija answer this question and let's see what yeah. her experiences were. I mean, 2017 feels like a long time ago, but um, I think it was just the community I was. I mean, I came to a high school. I went to Emma Willard High School in Troy, New York. So I think for me, that was a different than the people who are coming. I was at a sitting where I was just going to school. I already had everything, um, you know, they are looking to have, but it was just the community. They were very helpful and understanding. And they, you know, they connected me with, um, I, I, know I remember once I was, I missed food so much from home that the next day, one of my um, teachers, um, she took me to this Afghan restaurant that's, I think, in Schenectady. It's called um, Zaytun, which means olives, which was really good. I, I had missed food. So that was really nice, a really nice experience. We went with her family and they tried Afghan food. So I think, I mean, at the end of the day, it's not so much of like, materials or things we need it's just knowing that someone's there and you know they're there for us as a support system so that we can you know go and ask them for help or reach out so you know a lot of the time these people I think you know they might need a lot of emotional support um I know that therapy is um like a big part of uh, what Bard is trying to do and get students uh, therapists, but uh, it's again tricky just because English is not their first language. So maybe finding people who are who know Farsi and I know Susan is here and um, her husband knows Farsi, so maybe um, he can help us connect with a community who. Um, knows Farsi and can help with like that emotional aspect of things. Wonderful. And that I think is, is a lovely segue into introducing Susan Sprackman, um, who is one of the co-chairs of the Afghan Circle of the Hudson Valley to share a little bit about that effort. And I think also maybe some of what made you feel welcome when you first arrived in Afghanistan back in, when you went. So um, here's a picture of me about, can you see it? Um, oh my goodness. Yeah, <laughs> 52 years ago, 
when at the age of, of 21, I, um, my husband and I joined the Peace Corps and we went from Long Island to um, Afghanistan. And we lived in a city called Ghazni, which is the, was at the time the seventh largest city in Afghanistan, but was, you know, we had, there were two dirt roads, there was one cafe. Um, and I taught at the only girls' school in the whole province and had about 15 girls per grade um, that I was teaching. Um, it was, I suffered the reverse of the culture shock that Sina, Sina and Khadija had, you know, suddenly we had to learn the language. We had to, you know, learn how to take our shoes off, learn how to sit on the floor. Um, I had to learn not to look men directly in the face when I talked to them uh, because that was considered forward. And um, when I came back to the States, it took me actually um, a few weeks before I was comfortable doing that. Um, I sort of had this reverse transition. Um, the Afghan people were incredibly warm and, and welcoming and tolerant of things, of, of our learning curve. And um, they, um, we, you know, we had to figure out how to interact with them. At the beginning, our language skills were pretty meager and um, people giggled at me a lot. Um, the women would lift up my skirt to see, am I built the same way as they are? Um, <laughs> and it, you know, it, in um, to sort of further the joke, I'd lift up the the the, the um, their burkas a little bit for the feet and say, "Oh, I recognize you. I recognize those shoes." And um, it was it was it was pretty amazing. What what has broken my heart uh, recently is looking at the at the pictures of um, of Afghanistan and and I've seen some pictures of Ghazni where we lived and seeing how little change there has been in all of these years. Um, Kabul to us is unrecognizable. It has become a, you know, a fairly modern city with, with malls and, and well, at least before the Americans left with malls and, and tea shops, um, cafes. But I think in the villages, it's probably the way it was when we were invited to students' houses. Um, Paul, my husband, was sort of a captive in the room that was the best room in the house, which is where the men were. And I had total freedom because I could sit with the women, I could sit with the kids. And when it was time to eat, I would make sure to go sit with the men because they got served first and, and they were given the choicest pieces of, of food. Um, and uh, yeah, Afghan food is, 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 is amazing. Um, uh, by the way, um, Khadija, you should come over sometime. I make a mean kabali and really good oshak. And we have a bread oven and my husband makes naan. Um, the, um, the, the, the ingredients were limited and Afghan food doesn't use the myriad spices that are, uh, that are used, for example, in Indian food. People wonder, is it spicy or not? It's really good stews, really good rice, um, a, lot of, a lot of meat and a lot of vegetable. Um, I don't know, Hadija, if you're aware of Haddad's, rest, Haddad's Grocery in Poughkeepsie. It's a Middle Eastern grocery store. Um, they have all Afghan spices and they have halal meat there. Um, wow, I, I know, I was not. Yeah, it's, it's terrific. Uh, Maurice, who, who owns it, has offered our Afghan circle to be able to provide you know, spices and ingredients there. Um, and it's very, it's very welcoming. There's also a Turkish restaurant, um, sort of more, more of a takeout um, in Kingston called um, Masa Midtown, and they make mantu there um, sometimes, not on a regular basis, but it's really, it's really good. Um, I think, you know, a lot of what Sina and Khadija said, you know, are things that, that we as a welcoming, as a group that have been come together to welcome people have, you know, have been learning and thinking about. Um, somebody donated to us, everybody doesn't know this yet, a, a really nice um, Middle East, you know, oriental carpet that we can put on the floor. Um, I think we can get like foam cushions and cover them in fabric and those will become great cushions for people to sit on. Um, the, the importance of a pressure cooker is, is, 
is you know is, is can't be can't be under overstated. Um, the um, res respect for respect for women and respect for all people is is really important in in Afghan culture, and um, you know part of that you know has to do with making eye contact, but part of it also is 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 listening to people and trying to be uh, respectful. I know when we lived in Afghanistan, um, I didn't cover my hair, but I always wore shirts that went down to uh, below my elbow and uh, either loose pants or loose pants under dresses so that my legs were, were covered. And uh, after Afghanistan, we lived in Iran for four years and were shocked at how uh, there was a big um, uh, military base where we lived in Isfahan. And we were really horrified at how um, many people just didn't understand the need to be respectful of people when you're in their environment. And I think rather than expecting at the beginning the Afghan refugees to fit in our environment, we need to figure out how to fit in their environment and slowly help them understand the um, the culture that they are now in and, um, and, and work slowly with, with, with them. Um, as far as, as language, my, uh, my ability to speak Dari was, um, was very good when I lived there. And over the years, it, it has not only deteriorated, but it's become Iranified. And Afghan Dari is a very um, sort of straightforward language. It has a very nice rhythm to it. When we went to Iran, I, I said to my husband, I said, why are people singing all the time? It's just a different cadence to the, to the language. And I had to try to figure out how to adjust my accent. It's like think, if you think of American English and British English and Australian English, they're all mutually intelligible, but they're, they're di linguistically somewhat different. Um, and the rhythm of the language is different. And so now when, um, when I speak to, when I speak to Iranians, they ask me where in Afghanistan I come from because they couldn't, can't understand why and how an American could speak with that accent. And um, so I, so to, to transition from, from, from me to, to the Afghan circle, um, Harv Hillowitz, who um, spoke at the very beginning, um, came up with the idea that, that we need to have a group in, in this area, in the Kingston area, to welcome a refugee family. And he put um, letters to the editor in all of the local papers announcing what he was going to do. And I was so excited to, to read that because I've been, I've been interacting with a, an acquaintance who's been working at Fort Dix and sending supplies down there diapers and things like that, that people needed, but, you know, was really hungry for a way of working with some refugee families and, and sharing. And so, you know, Paul and I immediately contacted Harv, and now we have about 20 people who are part of what we consider the circle, and a number of other people who uh, have said that they will help out on an as-needed basis. Uh, fundraising has been Amazing. I, um, I'm in, in charge of opening the envelopes and every time I go to the post office and see 10 more envelopes there or open PayPal and see the contributions, um, small ones and large ones, it's great. Um, but um, for people who are listening to this and haven't donated yet, um, we still need you know, to, to continue fundraising. Um, hopefully we'll have a family soon. Um, but, you know, if we can afford to, we would love to be able to, after we get the first family settled, bring in a second family. Um, we've identified an apartment that will be ready for a family uh, with a pressure cooker and a carpet on the floor. Um, we have a website, um, afghancirclehudsonvalley.org, um, and you can donate via a check or, or PayPal. And there's some information about our circle. Um, if you have some skills that you'd like to offer, um, medical skills, somebody, if you're willing to just, you know, occasionally pick up uh, the family and take them grocery shopping, something like that, that would be a tremendous help. 
If you have experience with social services, doing driver's education, tutoring children, um, all of those skills will, you know, come to us and we'll try to find some way that you can contribute with us. Um, and I'm open to any questions that you may have. Oh, just, um, these are two Afghan dolls that my students made me. So 50 odd years ago, they were more pristine until my five-year-old granddaughter discovered them and she loves to, to play with them. But um, you can see the embroidered shirt and the little dress that's sort of similar to my dress. And, uh, Thank you so much, Susan, and, and to everybody who is involved in the in the effort of the Afghan Circle Hudson Valley. So you, Hannah put the, the link there in the chat. Um, I, I just want to thank everyone, um, and especially our speakers, Sina and Khadija, so much for sharing and, and giving so much warmth and personal experience and um, generosity of your time and knowledge um, to everybody here. Are there any last, um, any last questions anybody wants to, to add before we, before we close for the day? I want to say also that the um, Afghan Circle of the Hudson Valley is one of several efforts um, in the Hudson Valley. There have been several families that have already been resettled, and I know some of the folks here on the, the call have been a part of those efforts in Poughkeepsie and Rosendale and New Paltz. Um, and so uh, I just want to acknowledge and, and thank you for joining us and, and to ask you to be in touch and let us know both in terms of the needs of the families and the needs of other folks that you see, you know, like this kind of cultural primer for volunteers who are working to try to help. How might we as the Rear Center continue to, to help and support the work that, the vital work that you're all doing um, as we welcome, as we welcome our newest neighbors. So um, thank you so much. Thank you to Hannah for Zoom hosting. And uh, I think we'll close it there. I should mention that if anybody here is, is working with one of the other Afghan families, um, Paul, my husband, is, is, is available to um, help with translation, and he is you know, totally fluent. <laughs>